Hello and welcome to the fifth edition of Stones to Milestones Reading First webinar. It's a great start to the weekend to have everyone connect and join us from different parts of the world to talk about a topic that is very dear to our heart as educators and lifelong learners. Before I introduce the topic and the panelists, just a couple of things. Thank you, first of all, for sending in all your questions. We hope to cover them during our, uh, you know, the session over the next one hour. And if you have any further questions, you can raise them in the chat window that you have, or click on the raise your hand button, and we'll try and cover them uh, you know, during the session. So the topic for today is schools for the future. And you know, when you think of schools for the future, I'm reminded of a line from a, an old Wordsworth poem, a child is a father of man. You know, what it signifies is the importance and significance of childhood and the experiences and learning that, you know, we, which, we, which we acquire during our childhood days, shaping what we become when we grow up. You know, when, when I think of my childhood days and you know, the time I spent in school is, you know, stands out as, as you know, the most formative. And not just because of the academics, but because of the friendships, because of the skills, the books, the library, you know, the games, the sports. There are so many memories that come out when we think of you know, our school days. So considering you know, where we are today and considering how technology is evolving and you know, how our, our lifestyles are evolving uh, you know, into the future, how do we see these schools you know, where, we, where our children go evolving? You know, I think there are three primary questions that come to mind. You know, what would these schools look like in the future? And when I say what, it's not just the infra and the physical, the hardware, it's also the software, you know, what goes inside, the methodology, the pedagogy, the process. Uh, you know, the second question that comes out is, you know, why? So why would schools evolve and change? You know, I think there are different reasons which different people have. So why is another question that comes out when we think of schools of the future. And the third question is how? So, you know, understood that we need to change and, uh, you know, there, there is change required and, you know, we see the future schools in a different light. But how are these schools, you know, actually going to be different from what they are today? And to talk about all these and much more and to give us a very wide perspective, we have between us two very esteemed panelists who will get a very informed opinion on each of these questions uh, and a lot more. Uh, first, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, you know, to you Monica Mehta. Monica Mehta is currently advising a lot of edtech startups uh, in India and you know, working globally. So these edtech startups are you know, trying to achieve uh, you know, what we are going to talk about, uh, you know, how, how does the school life evolve over, over a period. So, so she is in a way schooling these edtech children uh, you know, in her role. And, uh, you know, she's until very recently been involved as director of investments with Omidyar Network, uh, focusing on the India Education Fund. So she's got very deep, uh, you know, expertise and insights into how the education uh, landscape out there has been and is evolving. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. Happy uh, to be yeah, and our second panelist is uh, Parmeet Shah. Parmeet is uh, CEO and owner of Next Schools. Uh, Next Schools is part of the Big Picture Network, which has been uh, you know, complemented by none other than Barack Obama and Bill Gates himself. So you know, he is, he's kind of leading it from the front uh, as being the, the CEO of Next Schools and Big Picture in India. He also wears a lot of other hats. You know, he self-schooled himself in wearing a lot of other hats. So we'll let you discover him during the course of the session. Uh, so welcome, Parmeet. Uh, you know, good to have you both uh, on the session. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's very exciting. Very happy to be here. So, uh, you know, without wasting much time, uh, you know, I would hand it over uh, to Monica and Parmeet, uh, you know, if you want to take it over and touch upon, uh, you know, some of the topics that we just, uh, you know, introduced and, uh, you know, through the session, we'll, we'll probably, uh, you know, have more questions. So, you know, we'll, we'll come back to you. So, Monica, over to you. So, I just shared the screen. I just wanted to check if the screen is visible. Uh, not yet, Monica. Now? It is now, yeah. Okay, great. Um, 
So thank you so much for this introduction uh, and good morning everyone. It's, it's uh, really great to be here. Both Parmeet and I are excited to share some of our thoughts and ideas uh, with all of you about the School of the Future and how we see it. Uh, but we would love for this uh, webinar to be as interactive as possible and uh, we try to make it interesting for all of the various stakeholders that are online today. Uh, to me, uh, most human beings are learning the wrong things the wrong way in schools today. Um, and when I think about a future school, uh, hopefully I think it's a school that's going to change that trajectory. Uh, I'd like to believe uh, that a future school will prepare children uh, for a workplace of the future, rather than just embed their minds with a whole bunch of knowledge. Um, uh, going to uh, uh, the second slide, um, and uh, hopefully you all can see that on the screen. Uh, really, we've moved from uh, what we call the agricultural age to the industrial age, and, and the education system largely today is, is still geared towards the industrial age. Um, I think in the uh, early 90s, we moved more into the information age. Uh, and uh, I think we're really at the threshold of now what we call the conceptual age. Uh, and unfortunately, while a lot of um, other aspects of our lives have moved on, right from we being a shared economy today, I think education is still largely uh, living in, in, in what I call the industrial age. Um, and, you know, uh, there are some skills that I have uh, put out um, on, the, on the right corner. Uh, and in the globalized world, non-academic skills are as critical as formal education as we know it. Uh, non-academic skills could be typ typified as creativity, entrepreneurship, teamwork, leadership, communication, resilience, and just the ability to thrive in a diverse cultural and social context. Uh, a common theme of discussion among education thought leaders today is centered on skills that are necessary for young people not only to survive, uh, but to thrive in the 21st century. Uh, also, there is broad consensus, consensus I think, uh, that uh, global inequality, not only educational, but also economic, um, is a driving force uh, for the promotion of a more equitable uh, education system that provides learners with these 21st century skills, as we call them. Um, Within this theme, there are some common ideas that have emerged. Um, I think uh, while knowledge is still viewed as important, there is consensus that education needs to be more holistic. Uh, skills, uh, like I mentioned, such as creativity and entrepreneurship, teamwork, resilience, et cetera, and the ability to thrive in these social contexts are gonna be more and more important. The students also need to be taught how to learn on their own, right? I mean, you give a little child an iPad today and you don't need to say much more to him or her, right? Uh, they're able to figure out a lot of things on their own. So, so self-learning um, and, and also self-monitoring for that example. Um, and, and, and just fostering self-reliance amongst them, I think is really important. Uh, there's also a need for a shift from content towards thinking and understanding, and then onwards you know, to a more holistic model. Uh, and this requires an increased focus, in my opinion, on uh, cross-disciplinary contexts, synthesizing different fields where students are able to see the bigger picture. Uh, and of course, uh, later Parmeet will talk about that big picture, but you know, uh, I, I, just see, I just feel that it, it's, it's very narrow in our traditional format of education. Um, also, students need to be thinking divergently, right? Uh, question uh, issues from very different positions, contexts, philosophical backgrounds, and even cultural perspectives uh, in, in schools of the future. Also important, I think, is the development of socio-emotional skills, and I can't emphasize that more from my perspective. I think that's, that's critical and very important going into the future. That includes determination, courage, you know, uh, creativity, imagination, and all of that. Uh, of course, it is difficult to teach all of this as well as to measure it, uh, and it kind of requires innovative pedagogies. Uh, and again, I think for me, through his experience of, of the work they do at uh, Next School, will be able to give you more uh, more examples of how they're doing it. Um, and of course, finally, uh, I, I believe that the effects of uh, artificial intelligence and the fourth industrial revolution or the, you know, or the conceptual age as we call it, uh, are that the key skills needed by graduates in the future will be social intelligence and ethics and you know, moral judgment and dexterity. So, so really, you know, that, that to me is um, the kind of skills that are gonna be required and that we as a teacher at schools of the future should be hoping our kids, our kids invite. 
uh, uh, moving on a little more, uh, you know, the workplace, of course, is changing. Uh, all of us that are in the corporate world or, or that are working in some form or fashion uh, realize that the workplace is more collaborative today. Uh, you know, just from a design space perspective, you've moved from individual cabins to, you know, large workspaces where people can collaborate and sit together and, you know, uh, and, and actually uh, work in a more casual environment. Uh, and these kids are going to be in that workplace maybe 20 years down the line. So I think it is important that we provide to them uh, classrooms and schools, uh, both from an infrastructure, but more importantly, from an experience perspective that, that lead, them, lead them very uh, uh, successfully into this workplace. And the workplace is going to have yellow collar workers uh, in the future as I see it, right? Um, these are, these are youngsters who want to solve a, an important problem. They want to contribute meaningfully. They don't want to just be doing another job. Uh, a, a lot of youngsters that I speak to talk about how they're looking for an experience and not just a job. I mean, for them, going to work is all about having an experience that is important to them. And of course, we talked about, in a, you know, a little earlier about the creativity part of it, and they are all right brain dominant, right? Um, uh, because of artificial intelligence and automation, a lot of uh, hard skills that human beings uh, might have today could be overtaken, but it's the softer skills, it's the right brain dominant skills that will be uh, the ones that will, that will really uh, come up to the fore. Uh, and, and Sorry, was somebody saying something? Yeah, so I was just asking Monica on this, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, it's not so much the infra, but more the experience, you know, in the current schools. Could you maybe just throw a little bit more light on, uh, you know, how would a school which has, uh, you know, an old age infra uh, kind of create those kind of experiences for children uh, to experience that openness, open environment? Yeah. So I'm at the, my, my, my next slides talk about it. So if you'll just uh, hold on for a couple more minutes, uh, uh, the, the very next slide will talk about that. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, just, just to round off, um, I believe that these yellow collar workers of tomorrow, the children of tomorrow, will exchange competence for competition, uh, compensation and not just a nine to five job. And uh, finally, I think, you know, they will be jack of all trades. They will know a lot about everything, but they will be master of more than one. I think we were in an age 30 years ago where we talked about, uh, you know, being master of one thing, but, but that's going to move on as well. Um, and so, so that's how I see the, the, the future workers and the future classrooms, uh, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that our graduates are those kind of future workers. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, now talking about what are these schools going to look like and what are the ideas and practices um, towards building these uh, schools of the future. Uh, one of them is, of course, we moving from being a, a a teacher-centric to a student-centric environment, right? Uh, I believe that uh, the student needs to be at the center of everything we do, everything we prepare for, everything we think about in the school. Uh, uh, you know, again, uh, teachers used to stand right in the right in the front, and and it was a very auditorium-style format. I think we need to move to a more collaborative format. Um, the, the changing role of a teacher. I think I mentioned earlier uh, today when you give children a piece of technology, they're able to figure out a lot of, lot of things on their own. So having said that, the teacher's role is critically important, but I think it was, it's going to move then from being just that of someone that disseminates knowledge or content to somebody that actually, actually helps you, catal uh, or rather helps you being a catalyst in, uh, in, in learning that knowledge on your own or in, or in actually self-learning. Um, and then, of course, technology, right? Uh, I, I think there's been enough conversation about technology and uh, whether that can replace a teacher, whether uh, technology just means having a bring your own device and, and one iPad per child. What does technology really mean for us? And to me, uh, to me, it can never replace a teacher. I think a teacher's role is critical. But I think we can use technology uh, as an enabler. Uh, one end, of course, content dis dissemination, right? I mean, you can use the flip classroom where kids are learning on their own back at home and coming to the classroom just for a discussion. Um, you know, or it could be used for differentiated instruction where, you know, based on the different learning levels of a child, you disseminate content or knowledge through technology based on the child's learning level. So it's not a one size fits all that we will use. 
but then technology can also be used as a data analytics tool. And to me, that is the absolute core of a future school. Uh, we need to use data to decide what we need to teach who. Um, and therefore, technology to that extent, in my opinion, is important to bring into the classroom. And when you move from assessment of learning to assessment for learning, then you're actually using technology to just understand where the child's learning levels are, where the gaps are, uh, what we need to do to remediate, and then therefore use differentiated instruction to, 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 to then you know, um, give out content or, or even give out remedial action by the teacher in terms of instruction to those children depending on where their gaps lie. Uh, and then, you know, moving on, uh, I mean, you know, interdisciplinary teaching, right? Uh, I, I think that rather than, I mean, in, in Finland, for example, they've done away with all subjects. So even though you might have, uh, you know, to your uh, question, Amit, you might have a, a more traditional looking classroom, uh, you know, we can always um, have interdisciplinary work happening, which means uh, whether it's math, science, uh, English, uh, social sciences, uh, we can just take a topic and, and put it all across. It could just be something like the water cycle and you can teach it through all of the various subjects as we understand it traditionally. Yeah. And then last but not the least, uh, you know, we were talking about the skills in, in one of the previous slides. What are the kind of skills that are essential uh, for the future? And I've said enough about that, but I think it's all about embedding that. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell someone, okay, uh, we're going to teach you empathy today. Um, I, 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 that, that's, that's hard to teach, right? But uh, we can embed it very creatively through content and through the work we do, through projects that we do. Uh, again, Fermi will talk a little bit about the passion project uh, that they have at Next School, but, uh, but it, it's through these things that we can teach them some of these essential skills uh, for the 21st century. Um, moving on uh, to some more uh, ideas and practices that one can use towards building out that future school. Uh, of course, uh, you know, while we talked about all the non-space related um, uh, topics, I think a fluid space design is equally important. Um, um, I, I can't uh, seem to imagine uh, in the future to have classrooms the way we understand it, where there are grades one, two, three, four, five, and there are divisions one uh, A, one B, one C. I really see it as being learning spaces. Um, so a new school that I'm designing currently for the uh, Sun Pharmaceutical uh, family, um, uh, here in Bombay, uh, is going to have um, no classrooms whatsoever, only learning spaces. So you'll have a science lab, you'll have a math lab, you'll have a language lab, an environmental uh, center, uh, all sorts of places. And students will move from, you know, learning space to learning space during the day. Uh, again, we will have multi-grade classrooms, so it is not dependent on the age of the child, but the learning level of the child. And therefore, you will kind of... Um, uh, integrate learning spaces along with multi-grade classrooms where children across three age groups could be sitting together based on their learning level. So for example, I might be in grade six, but my learning level for math might be that of a grade four student, uh, and I might be in grade six, but my level of English might be that of a grade eight. So I should not be uh, pulled behind if I have a, a, a faster pace of a learning level, but at the same time, if I'm weaker at something, I should be given the opportunity to be self-paced and to move along my pace to, to catch up uh, on that particular front. Um, and then uh, I, I think fluid space, spaces should also encourage innovation, right? Uh, uh, at Next School, they've got a lovely maker lab and, and we are building that out as well uh, at, the, at the Sun Pharma School, which is called Shikha Academy, by the way. Um, and, and I think maker spaces and innovative spaces just for kids to be able to uh, imagine and create and, 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 and think as broadly as possible is important. Um, I already talked about the grade wise classrooms uh, and the multi grade classrooms, so, so I'll jump that. Uh, but I think I want to touch upon another important topic here, um, and that's the parents, uh, right? Uh, I think, again, traditionally, schools tend to uh, leave out parents as important stakeholders in the child's progress. And I think, uh, again, uh, the future classrooms, the way I see it, Parents are a very, very important stakeholder. And um, I think schools tend to deliver what parents are demanding. It's really a demand supply situation. So unless we change parental mindsets to understand what the kids need in terms of skill sets for the future, it's hard to deliver on them. So it's important to bring them in, have community outreach programs so that parents understand why we want to do things differently and how we want to do things differently. And also so that the home becomes an extension of the school. 
it's, it's difficult to imagine a school that is futuristic, the way we are talking about it. And yeah. then for the children to finish that day in school and then go home and come back to a traditional format uh, where parents are pushing them every day just to kind of finish homework and, you know, and kind of go through tuitions and, and, and the rut as, as we understand it. So I think, uh, you know, for student success, uh, parental engagement is really uh, important uh, as well. Uh, pretty much that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to um, uh, let, let Parmeet take over at this point. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to put on a couple of slides uh, for him uh, once, once he's uh, started off. So, uh, Monica, on, on you know, what we just covered, uh, you know, just a couple of thoughts uh, that were coming and maybe we could discuss a little bit about that and then we can get on to Parmeet. Uh, one, you know, with the schools, uh, you know, uh, we're looking at the schools evolving in this manner. Uh, how how do we see children who come out with these new age schools, uh, you know, get into the, uh, you know, uh, get into higher education when they, when they get into higher education, you know, say a college, you know, they're still back to, uh, you know, the old uh, format of education. So how do we see that shift happening, you know, in a more seamless manner, where a child who is going into a you know, progressive new age school, uh, when when he or she comes out, does not feel out of place in a traditional you know, higher education environment. Yeah. Um, I think that's changing as well, Amit, uh, at least in Bombay. And, and I, uh, I wouldn't want to speak for all of India because I, I mean, I, it's just not my uh, uh, domain expertise. Uh, we see a lot of new age colleges coming up. Uh, we, you know, we have the Indian School of uh, Management and Entrepreneurship. We have the Indian School of Design and Innovation. Uh, and, and when you go see these colleges, they're absolutely exactly like I'm talking about a future classroom. Uh, they don't look like traditional colleges. They're not taught in the traditional way. Uh, they're given a lot of um, uh, space, uh, both physical and otherwise, to, to, to create things the way they want them. Uh, classes are a lot more fluid. Uh, uh, again, the, the, the traditional format of if you chose BCom and then you're only going to do finance and accounting and uh, marketing, et cetera, has changed. And all of these colleges are allowing them to very freely choose from various different subjects from various disciplines. So I think that's happening in higher education as well. Of course, it's a, it's a choice uh, for the student and the parent to make whether they want to make that choice, right? Whether they want to go into a traditional format or whether they want to continue. Sure. Uh, but I see a lot of children moving out of IGCSE and IB schools that are unable to fit into the regular format, right? Then for them to, in Bombay, the context would be like a Xavier's or a HR college to be able to go and do a regular BA, BCom, BSc becomes that much harder because they've already gone through uh, several years of, of thinking out of the box. And then yes. for them to be pushed uh, and huddled into a classroom for a very traditional format of lecturing is hard. Right. So they're already making those uh, uh, differentiated choices. Right. Right. So, yeah, I think, thank you. And uh, Parmeet, over to you now. Um, great. Um, so, Monica, actually, uh, if we could just have the screen sharing off for a bit, uh, we'll just revive it up in a bit uh, before we get to a uh, big picture. Um, so, um, basically, uh, you know, Monica, uh, this... First of all, that was just great, uh, Monica. You know, uh, I couldn't agree more with everything that you mentioned. Uh, you know, just the vision of the future. And it's so obvious that all of these things are happening. I hope it's obvious to all of us. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I would like to mention is, so, you know, uh, we, we saw some of the skills that uh, Monica spoke about, right? Uh, and, and some of the skills that are really, really important today. Uh, things like entrepreneurship, leadership, communication, collaboration, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is, uh, you know, how much of this do we do in our schools today, uh, right? Uh, and, and what do we end up doing instead, right? Uh, so uh, I'll pick up on this thought, just a quick introduction so you guys have some context. Um, so uh, basically, um, I uh, got into education uh, simply because I was an extremely frustrated student myself. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, for after years and years of just cribbing about the education system, I actually got an opportunity to uh, do something. So I really grabbed that opportunity and said, uh, you know, uh, okay, I've just been cribbing about this forever. Uh, me, let me take that negative energy and convert it into something positive. Uh, so, uh, you know, and the platform was really great. Uh, you know, it was an opportunity to really, really, uh, because it's a private school to really do uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, whatever sort of, uh, you know, just explore the world and do whatever, uh, you know, uh, I thought was the best. 
um, and uh, it was a very long process. So uh, basically, uh, in the beginning, you know, as I said, I only knew what I didn't want to do uh, in this school, uh, right? And which is basically most of what goes on in the traditional education system. Uh, but I had no idea what I wanted to do or what the future of education will look like or, you know, so uh, it was a very long process, uh, you know, um, actually at the end of, there was a six year research and development uh, process uh, where I was just trying to find answers to these questions. Uh, and, um, uh, and so now today, it's been about eight years since uh, the first thought uh, came, uh, you know, of, of kind of taking on this initiative. Uh, and there's just a lot I've learned and realized uh, you know, over these eight years about uh, what is learning, what education should be about, uh, you know, and, and a lot, lot more reflections, honestly, now, uh, when I look at it, uh, you know, I, you know, uh, I hadn't even identified, I would say 10% of the problems uh, with the system when I first started. And in the, over the last eight years, it's been like, oh my God, you know, like what, what are we doing? Uh, so, uh, you know, so just picking up from, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, what what I was talking about earlier, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, creativity, collaboration, communication, uh, right? These are the things that in the 21st century, uh, you know, uh, are incredibly important. Uh, and what goes on in our schools today, though, uh, you know, that's more like history, geography, mathematics, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, uh, right? Uh, so how did that happen, right? And where where does this stuff come from, right? And why aren't we directly dealing with these new age concepts or new age skills, uh, right? Uh, and actually, so, you know, I've realized, yes. right? Uh, they were people who were going to become university professors. The rest of the 99% of the population, uh, uh, there was no education for them as such, right? Uh, so that's kind of where our system comes from. And if you look at it today, the only occupation that the education system is relevant to is that of becoming a university professor, right? Uh, who uses things like trigonometry, you know, uh, calculus, balancing equations, who uses all this stuff? You know, uh, I bet none of us have had to do it. I mean, I guess there's a lot of educators here, so you probably have, but people in the real world, uh, you know, they don't need to do that. Uh, you know, so, uh, 80% of my work is actually in a, a construction and engineering business, uh, right? Uh, and I work with architects, I work with engineers day in and day out. Uh, and even they don't need to use this stuff, right? Uh, nobody is sitting and solving equations in offices, you know? Uh, today, softwares do that, right? It's very simple. Uh, so that's really the big, big, uh, you know, um, so basically what we do. Uh, you know, so today I'm kind of going to talk about two things, what we do in education and how we do it, right? Uh, so the what part, you know, is largely obsolete and irrelevant, right? Uh, and it comes from this age old idea of, uh, you know, becoming a university professor, literally just reflecting that, right? Uh, and today, if you ask me, you know, so there's a lot of temptation to think that no, 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 what we do in schools it's the basics, right? It's the basics that we need to do anything in life, right? Uh, but I would argue today, uh, even the basics need to change, right? Uh, today, it's, I would argue it's more important for kids to be able to code, uh, for them to be able to make presentations, uh, you know, uh, and all of these things for them to be able to start businesses, uh, communicate with others, collaborate with others, uh, you know, those should be the basics of today, right? Uh, so, uh, so that was one uh, key thing, uh, you know, where it's like, uh, uh, you know, what we are doing in school today is really like this little thing uh, uh, called academics, right? Uh, and there is a much, much larger thing, uh, you know, uh, today, which I mean, I would just call like life itself, right? What do you need to be successful in life? What do you need to be successful in your career? has actually very little to do with what we are doing in schools, right? Uh, so that's really, uh, you know, um, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, big picture comes in. Uh, and uh, so, Monica, we could uh, bring up the slides now. Uh, so big picture in a very simple way, uh, I would say is um, a framework or a structure that helps you take on this larger circle 
of how you can be successful in life you know because uh, you know it's quite clear to the people at big picture and even to me that uh, if we just you know th- do the academic part you know as i said largely irrelevant and very little to do with success in life uh, you know especially i don't know uh, Uh, what your experience is my experience now of having been out of the education system for 8 to 10 years uh, you know a lot of my friends everyone who was doing uh, you know great in school is not necessarily doing great uh, now and and frankly most of the kids who are not at all doing well in school are doing fantastically now uh, right uh, and and i'm sure you have similar experiences uh, so basically big picture was really uh, the result of this you know six year uh, r&d process as i said uh, you know uh, and finally uh, it seemed that uh, you know i found something that really really made a ton of sense to me uh, obviously there is a you know this is honestly a whole new uh, philosophy of learning and theory of learning so uh, you know and and uh, i think i have about 15 minutes today out of which i think i'm almost happy through so it's uh, difficult to get into all of these aspects uh you know uh, so i'll try to do my best uh, with the time that we have um so uh, you know so just uh, you know some of the stuff this is actually a really big uh, movement uh, all over the world uh, you know 20 years ago it started in uh, the us uh, and now it's in more than nine countries uh, they have 165 uh, schools and every day it's uh, growing uh, so a lot of people and honestly if you ask me uh, you know as i said you know this has been a very long research process uh, you know and then i'm always uh, you know uh, looking at what new things are happening in education uh, and there is you know there are so many new things happening there are so many incredible things happening in the education system today uh, you know in how we are doing it and what we are doing it uh, you know there's technology coming in there's all of this amazing stuff happening but my biggest criticism actually has been that very very few of these new ideas are actually going beyond this little circle called academics right uh, so um, that is what is a little disappointing to me uh, and uh, you know what we are doing today is yeah like we are trying to do this in a different way right uh, we are trying to uh, bring tech into it we are trying to bring software into it we are trying to do all kinds of things you know different kinds of assessments we are trying to do all of this stuff but this is still just to make sure that our kids are better in an academic sense right uh, so um, uh, that's really the key uh, thing and which is where big picture and there were a handful of others you when i can uh, you know uh, tell you about them uh, things like ed visions uh, you know who who really are thinking much beyond this circle you know uh, what we are saying by the way uh, you know I, I, you know I, i'm sure these thoughts are um, Uh, a bit uh, radical uh, you know because uh, there's uh, it's really really uh, you know not many uh, not much of this out there uh, i just wanted to clarify i'm not saying that we won't do this we won't do academics right so that's not uh, at all a choice honestly at the at the moment the kids need to go to university they need to be able to give exams uh, there's no denying that we must accept that reality but we are also going to look at this other bigger circle right uh, so we'll talk a little more about what that looks like and how that works uh, so just a little bit about big picture uh, you know um, uh, and i guess we could uh, just move to the uh, next slide as well um, yeah and uh, it's it, in the us it's really really taken off you know so uh, barack obama has uh, you know specially kind of mentioned them and identified them and they obviously you know that's a really big deal uh, and uh, bill and melinda gates foundation actually uh has uh you know uh they are the biggest uh, uh funders uh, of uh, uh, of big picture learning uh, so they have you know two two rounds of funding almost 25 million dollars that they have uh, donated to this uh, and uh, they uh, have identified and called it their favorite high school in america uh, so that also says a lot uh, that the thought leaders uh, of the us uh, have really really uh you know pinpointed uh you know this particular philosophy and said that there's something really really interesting uh going on here um so uh, that was a bit about big picture uh now i'll try to i'll move to the how part right uh so when we are talking about taking on 
you know, real world learning and real life learning, uh, how that happens is very different. As Monica said, you know, we can't sit kids down in a classroom and be uh, like, okay, let's teach you empathy. You know, uh, we've all been there, right? In our moral science class. I honestly don't remember what really exactly we did uh, in that class. Uh, so uh, there is a different way uh, of learning, uh, you know, when it comes to these more important things, right? Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, you know, I'm going to take you, uh, we could just move to the uh, next one. So I'm going to take you through uh, this particular framework. Uh, honestly, it's something that I have made up myself and it's still just like a first version, uh, you know. Um, so what uh, this is going to help us uh, think more clearly about is uh, the learning environment, right? Uh, and how we can move from teacher driven to student driven learning, right? And uh, things start looking very, very different when you actually do that. Uh, so basically at the, you know, uh, so, the, you know, so there's some kind of pyramid, uh, you know, and the learning is through listening and seeing, right? Uh, that's what the learning, uh, uh, how the learning happens, or at least is supposed to happen. Uh, right. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I hope I don't need to uh, talk too much about this, that uh, this simply doesn't work. You know, uh, you know, any uh, teacher who's really, really reflected on this will know that the engagement level is terribly low. You know, uh, I would bet on anything that 50% of the kids are not even looking straight. They're probably looking around somewhere. Right. Uh, and, and the other 50%, I was the other 50%, honestly, you know, sitting in the front row, nodding my head. Uh, but what's going on in here, it's got nothing to do with what the teacher is talking about. I'm just trying to please the teacher, right? Uh, basically, my argument is that what's really going on in the minds of the children uh, has very little to do with what the teacher is talking about, right? Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, you know, um, it's, it's quite obvious because actually it's simply not stimulating enough. You know, it's simply not stimulating yeah. enough and we are not meant to learn like this. Sorry, Amit, you were going to uh, say No, something. no, I, I was just nodding, yeah, saying, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's simply not, uh, you know, uh, uh, stimulating enough and, you know, we've all been here, you know. Uh, the funny thing is, I'm sure, you know, a lot of you guys, you've tuned in to, uh, you know, learn some new thoughts. You must have heard of TED.com, right? Uh, you know, so that is the place where the great, greatest people on the planet come and uh, lecture. You know, uh, and uh, the funny thing is, they get only 20 minutes. No matter if you're Barack Obama or Bill Gates or, uh, you know, whoever, you don't get more than 20 minutes because that is just the attention span of a human adult. Now imagine what the attention span of a child is, uh, you know. Uh, so moving on to workshopping, I actually like this a lot more uh, because here, yes, it is a teacher driven environment, but the kids are learning through doing some, right? Either you are solving a worksheet or you're doing some hands-on activity. So the learning is through doing and not simply sitting and listening and seeing, you know? Uh, so um, here, uh, you know, because of that, the engagement and the learning is much, much higher, uh, right? Uh, but now, uh, you know, we'll talk a bit more about the self-driven forms, right? And here, I just want to make a quick uh, you know, analogy, right? Um, you, you guys must have heard of this, uh, you know, uh, there is this very popular saying, uh, education is not the filling of a vessel, but the lighting of a fire, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, what, uh, in the traditional system and in these teacher-driven kind of environments, right? It is the filling of a vessel idea, right? We are basically saying that, you know, here is a child, uh, you know, he doesn't know anything, you know, and here is the syllabus, you know, we have decided that this is all the stuff that is important for a child to know. And we are simply going to dump this all day long, right? We are going to just keep putting this in history, geography, mathematics. This is what's important. This is what you need to learn, right? Uh, what I want to argue today is that that is simply not the way of the human mind works, right? Uh, it is more of that lighting of a fire bit, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, and there's a lot 
that's being written on this if you think if you talk if you look at what dan pink uh, uh, is talking about uh, he's the author of this book called drive uh, uh, there is uh, peter gray uh, who's a, a you know education psychologist he has a book called free to learn uh, this is hands down if you ask me one book on education that everyone must read you must read this what they are saying is that uh, kids and in fact all human beings have a very strong innate drive to learn right think about a 3 month old baby a 6 month old baby they are self driven in their learning they are moving around pulling things pushing things putting things in their mouth sniffing things they are learning by themselves just think about this in our country most kids before they start school at the age of 3 already can speak two languages right at least maybe three language learning is one of the most complex cognitive functions it is incredibly hard and anyone who's tried i think we've lost parmeet for a while uh, so uh, yeah i think he was talking about language learning uh, where he left off uh, so i think you know uh, definitely that is one area which uh, is going to be a significant skill you know to be picked up going forward i mean i think you know when we when, when monica was touching upon the skills for the future uh, you know this self paced learning is all about how do we how do we keep ourselves uh, you know up to date with uh, with what's changing around us uh, so monica just one question for you there how do you place uh, you know reading skill as uh, you know how do you integrate that with all the skills that we are talking about you know for our future uh, success and you know the future uh, skills that we need yeah so in in kind of the the you know the work i've been doing and 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 the research we've been uh, doing even when i was at omedia network um i think what we found is that when you can read well uh your your of course parmeet was arguing that you know we we should move away from subject based learning so so i'm not going to really uh yeah. talk about it from a subject perspective but whatever else you need to learn and uh, for for our context it could be history geography social science etc but Uh, but even if it was not uh, parmeet is back but i was just making a point i quickly parmeet so yes. um, uh, it's it's reading that sure. really enables you to then uh, be able to grasp topics or 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 gain knowledge or or you know uh, be successful at just being able to communicate in my opinion more than anything else um, so so to us uh, when we and we know we used to deal a lot with uh, municipal schools and government schools right. and to always focus more on the reading because the minute you understand a language and you're able to read and write uh, then everything else follows right whether it's with its maths social sciences um sciences all of that uh, just becomes that much easier for the child to grasp but uh, parmeet uh, go ahead sure sorry about that guys there has been just some crazy power issues it's been raining and lightning here in bombay like crazy um so uh, yeah so basically as yeah, so i was talking about these innate learning mechanisms right and you think about language learning and honestly if you think about in your personal life all the great learning that you have had you know i would argue will all be self driven uh, right uh, so that's really the key shift you know about okay you know how do we move from uh, filling these vessels to lighting these fires right and just quickly, uh, and um sorry parmeet sure. uh, you know just quickly on that point uh, you know uh, one one thought that was just coming is uh, you know with the with all the teachers you know that we have uh, you know who have you know kind of helped us uh, light that lamp within us you know i think it's a, it's a time to celebrate uh, you know their contribution in our lives as well so while we understand you know, the importance of uh, evolving you know our, our teaching methodology i think you know what has gone on so far has been quite significant right i mean i think uh, uh they would be the first one to understand that you know they need to evolve as well <laughs> absolutely absolutely and honestly this is everything that i'm talking about today is about the system is about the software it's not at all about the people you know because uh, i mean the people uh, and the teachers and the educators out there they are there is so honestly all the teachers that have come and joined uh, you know us over here at next they are all people who are similarly frustrated with the system right uh, and uh, so i think everyone is a victim in a way uh, right uh, and it's really really beautiful so you know what i was getting at uh, was uh, if we change the role uh, of the teacher 
you know, of course, first we need to change the system, uh, you know, uh, to something. So at a very philosophical level, something that helps you, uh, you know, uh, helps you sort of unleash this, what's already inside you. Right. So all of us have this drive, this talent, this passion, you know, there's, there's a hundred words for it, but we have something in us that we, that we want to express. Right. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the system is such that many times it really beats it out of you, you know, and which is what so many people have spoken about people like Ken Robinson, uh, you know, who have actually measured how creativity is diminishing as uh, you progress in school. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what we really should be uh, doing is helping. And this is what life is about, right? Uh, for the first 20 years of your life in the education system today, you are told, uh, you know, do this and you'll be successful. You know, you're told exactly what to do. Do this, yeah. do this, do this, do that, do this, uh, right? And you'll be successful. And then suddenly when out in the real world, people are like, okay, yeah, so what do you want to do? Right. right? Uh, how we, nobody has asked you this question within the education system, right? Uh, and that's very scary. So what I'm trying to say is in the real world, this is how things work. You've got to figure things out yourself because only you know yourself. You know your talents, you know your passions, you know your strengths, right? right. Uh, and uh, to be successful in the real world, it's about figuring out how you can express this, you know, in a meaningful way, in a way that you can contribute to others and make a living for yourself, right? It's as right. simple so, as that, in a way. Yeah, yeah so Parmita, uh, you know, just in, in the interest of time, uh, you know, I was, no. I was uh, you know, thinking if you could just cover a couple of, uh, you know, strategies or, uh, you know, your, from your experience uh, with next school, uh, right. You know, some of the uh, uh, processes that you've seen, you know, uh, formats uh, in the revised or the new age education. Absolutely. Format. Absolutely. And, uh, so, you know, okay. We could, we could cover some of the questions, you know, that uh, audience has. Absolutely. Sounds great. So, basically, uh, what I'll do is I'll skip to this project based learning. <laughs> Sorry, that's a very long and there's an acronym. That's basically stands for individualized project based learning. That's the kind of category I put big picture in. Uh, you know, uh, and there it actually follows a very simple template. Now, again, just uh, remember the intention here is for kids to really be able to express their inner drive, their talents, their passions. And this is different for every single kid, right? Uh, so what individualized project based learning, it's a very simple template. And honestly, uh, we can all do this in our schools tomorrow, right? Uh, we just need to find some time in the structure uh, and the schedule for this. It follows a very simple template, set a goal, right? Uh, create a plan, right? And then persevere through till you actually achieve whatever that output was. And what big picture says is this entire template should produce something that is, has real world value, right? Uh, so we are not saying, okay, ideally your goal should not be that, uh, you know, whatever I'll do research in a particular, it shouldn't have, it shouldn't be academic. It should be a real world. Uh, thing so it, it might be that okay you know what I want to build uh, you know so this is a this is an example uh, you know from our school I want to build a solar power uh, power bank that was one of the first projects uh, you know uh, and and that you know of course uh, you know uh, so very good so, so you know we actually help them set goals okay what's the first thing you need to do maybe you need to design it and you know uh, so I won't get into the details but just imagine at the end of like you know a two or four months uh, you know, uh, there was this kid who actually built a solar, it was a working solar power, uh, power bank, uh, you know, uh, and there's a lot more examples, uh, you know, um, so uh, there is someone who wants to be a fashion designer, uh, right, uh, at next, uh, and uh, basically, in the, so it's, we just finished our first year, by the way, uh, and she has an entire line of, uh, uh, you know, her own line of fashion, uh, sort of, you know, different, I Honestly, I don't know much on this topic. So, uh, you know, it's like different dresses and capes and, you know, cover-ups and, uh, you know, so that's all stuff that she has made, right? Uh, there's a hairstylist who has mastered over uh, 70 hairstyles, right? Uh, this is all happening over and above the academic learning. And my only argument is this is incredibly deep learning in a very different kind of way, right? A person who has made a solar panel, you know, and, uh, you know, Monica has been to a maker space. There's kids making all kinds of stuff, just whatever they dream of, you know, they just, and it's actually possible today with the power of the internet and the maker movement to be able to make these things. So just imagine there's, there's a kid who's building his own mobile phone, you know, 
when you are doing these things the kind of learning now the kid will look at a phone very differently you know i i look at a phone and i'm like magic how does this happen I, you know i don't even bother trying to understand what it is this kid knows what's actually happening right uh, so they are just going to the, the one time you build a phone your life has changed everything you look at now you will look at it differently right so right. that is the power of uh you know uh this project based learning uh, and that is the power of uh you know it's a very different kind of learning is the whole argument that i'm trying to make and it's a very it's it's much deeper much more relevant in today's world and obviously i didn't really talk oh. about then other things like you know being able to set your goals manage your time you know obviously there's creativity involved there's communication involved all of those skills that monica was talking about in her first slide yeah. so if this, i if i may uh, parmeet i just wanted to make no. say one thing uh, since you've talked about project based learning i think what that also essentially involves uh, which which you did touch upon but i want to elaborate is that we then bring down the need for going into depth in all your other core subjects like you still learn math you still learn science you still learn english but to so the depth that we go is not required and i think parmeet started saying that in the beginning saying you know you don't really need trigonometry i mean you need math but the kind of math we use in our day to day lives is pretty basic so as long as the kids right. are learning everything else you get a lot more time in your day for the project based learning that you know parmeet is talking about so it's not like kids are not learning all the other what we call essential stuff but it's just that they're learning to the extent that they need to learn it right so uh, parmeet i think uh, you know we are nearing uh, you know kind of completion of I'm the no, no. so if you if you could summarize you know your uh you know your points and then we could maybe take a few questions from the audience yeah i'm i'm basically done i think we could move to the question and answer bit yeah. sure great so you know i think that was a great learning uh, just one one question there you know which came to me is you know uh, for this project based learning that you that you implemented uh, you know in your school uh, what kind of teacher skills you know or you know facilitator skills would you need because you know this would be very different from say a regular teacher right so do you upskill the same teachers do you do you need to get specialized people from outside or agencies to to you know get this done right so that's obviously like you know that's typically the first question we get um honestly uh, the one key key missing ingredient i would say the the biggest uh, you know practical issue we have with this uh, is that the whole idea of project based learning is uh, you know especially with big picture it has to be a real world connect right uh so for a, for the fashion designer to be learning more about fashion right how do how do as as a teacher how do i help her right uh so that becomes uh, difficult because now you know uh, you know and we don't expect the teachers to know like you know 100 different uh, industries and domains right uh so one thing is of course in the big picture program there is a mentor uh so each child actually has a real world mentor who helps a lot more with this Um, yeah. but uh, the role is uh, you know uh, uh, very different uh, th- so what i was saying is the issue is uh, you know um, the real world exposure is very very important right uh, so you at least want the teachers to have some idea that okay you know as a as a fashion designer uh, you know what is your path ahead you know what kind of goals uh, should you set right right uh, right Uh, so and, uh, that is i would say the biggest challenge uh, that we are facing and we are trying all kinds of different things to bring that kind of exposure uh, you know to our uh, staff right and what kind of inertia do you do you face from parents uh, you know are parents generally supportive of this or do you have to do a lot of awareness i know monica touched upon you know involving parent as important stakeholders earlier when when she was uh, you know uh, speaking but uh, what about you i mean how do you uh, how do you kind of educate uh, or get the parents buy in right so uh, frankly uh, you know uh, you guys you know you guys already would have guessed all of these ideas are very out there in a way uh, you know so to expect parents to even uh, you know so first to understand and then to support and uh, is is uh, definitely a very big challenge i would say we have kind of like a bell curve you know we have i would say maybe 20 30% of our parents who are you know are early adopters our biggest fans they are crazy about this system you know uh, so they are our evangelists really uh, you know and then i would say the middle 50% uh, maybe knows a little bit right uh, you know and then of course there is another 
uh, I would say a good 15-20% who doesn't really have much of a clue and probably are here because like it's an IB school or you know they liked how it looked or something like that. Uh, so there is a whole range uh, honestly uh, and uh, definitely you know we, we are trying very very hard uh, you know uh, to educate uh, you know uh, the parents. Uh, you know one a big thing is when uh, they see that the kids are doing all this other stuff uh, you know, the, the pressure on us has always so far in the last year been that, okay, okay, but academics to kar rahe na, you know, like, okay, that's happening, right? Uh, you know, so that is a big uh, thing where, uh, you know, uh, because uh, the conception and the idea that uh, the masses today have of the education, of what education is like is, again, obviously very, very different from what we are doing in school. So there's always that bit of a tug of war going on but what right. we are trying to do is show that you know and convince parents that you know as i said that's what even this pyramid kind of does which is that there are these other kinds of learning that that is happening and we all must recognize and respect that uh, you know that's when really we'll be able to uh, bring a sh- shift in the mindset so yeah, so uh, Monica, I guess uh, you know you can stop screen now, uh, your share screen, and we can take a few questions from the audience. Sure. So uh, audience, uh, you know, I think this was a really insightful, uh, you know, from get, hearing from both Parmeet and Monica. So I'll maybe cover a couple that we've received on the chat window. Uh, you know, one of the questions was, uh, you know, with how do we manage, uh, you know, some of the teachers, uh, you know, who are currently you know, teaching in their, in, the, in their own methods, how do we upskill them, uh, you know, considering, uh, you know, they need to complete the curriculum, the syllabus, uh, you know, with the school's uh, old systems, how, how can they upskill themselves and, you know, manage the new age requirements? So anybody, Monica or uh, Parmeet, uh, if you want to take that. Okay, sure, take that, Monica. Um... I mean, I, I, I don't really think there's a course to do this, right? I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not a course that you can go through and say that, okay, now I'm going to be uh, a teacher for the school of the future. I, I don't think something like that exists. I think that it's more of a mindset shift, right? You've got to change the way you think about your role as a teacher or your role as an educator. And I think uh, Parmeet touched upon that a little bit. Uh, but, but my honest opinion is that the role of the teacher needs to change. And uh, Parmeet was going to start talking about self-paced learning when you logged off. And that's what the role is, right? When, you, when children are learning at their own pace and that there's a lot of self-learning uh, that that's happening, then the role of the teacher needs to shift to being that of a catalyst and, and helping the child along that personalized learning journey. And then right. you need to start thinking of yourself more as a mentor and not as a teacher. So to me, uh, you know, to really uh, equip yourself to be a teacher for the new age and, and for the new uh, the future schools that we've been talking about, it's how you start thinking about your role in the classroom. So, right. you know, uh, Parmeet had put up that cup and, you know, we were talking about filling all that information. It's now, the information exists out there, right? I mean, in, in, in 30 years ago, we didn't have the internet. Now the information right. exists. It's really, how do you help the child understand that information in, in the context of his or her own world. How do you help the child to really take that information and make it meaningful for him or herself, uh, including the project-based learning that you were talking about, right? So I think it's right. more about thinking through that. And I don't really think there's a cause for that, but I really think that, you know, the more and more you, I mean, there's a lot of material out there. The more you read, the more you engage, the more examples you see of people having done that out there. There's a lot of schools including big picture, but there are other schools in the West that are adopting this. Uh, you know, the more you read and see, I think that's the best way to learn and pick up. Or maybe at least that's my take or my sense. Right. So we'll just see if there's any other uh, live question. If not, uh, I think there is one from uh, Dr. Dheeraj Mehrotra. Uh, so sir, yeah, if you want to ask me a question. Yes, I just want to ask questions from both of you all. It was mm-hmm. really indeed a great and a fascinating display of deliberations. Above all, my question is, how do you gather support from the parents with this experimental view of future classrooms? And uh, I am very sure the teachers, as you said, that the training is absolutely necessary because they belong to a different age altogether. So how do you change the mindset of the teachers, the parents, and above all, the other stakeholders? Thank you. 
maybe i could uh, uh, start with that and monica can add later so honestly uh, definitely and i can see a few other questions also uh, you know similar to this uh you know and uh, uh, you know honestly my personal experience was you know we fortunately got the chance to actually start you know with a very clear cut idea and concept right uh, so uh, so it was basically all the parents who were coming to us they knew exactly what they were getting i mean not maybe not exactly but they knew what they were getting into right uh, and we could always kind of uh, you know go back to that and said that hey you know what this is what we had said we would do so when we actually doing it you know don't be so surprised right uh, so uh, that's what it was uh, for us but obviously i can imagine that uh, you know uh, with uh, different uh, you know with existing schools and existing setups it can be very very challenging right because if the parents are me this is not what we signed up for uh, so i would again uh, you know recommend that uh, maybe if we have smaller uh, programs within a larger program where it is by choice right uh, so it's important that parents and the families express their choice that yes this idea that what you're talking about you know whatever that might be you know a different idea new idea that you're talking about is this is what it is first of all so clarifying what that is and what that will look like uh, and getting them to make that choice that yes this is what i feel is right for my uh, child and uh, so that's where we are going to go uh because a whole whole same change to an existing system uh, i can imagine is very very difficult right so you are you are talking of giving an option to parents to decide you know whether they want to choose it or not so uh, yeah, i have great, a couple thoughts on that uh sure. let me add uh, Please, yeah. so 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 i think that uh, you know as parents and i mean i'm being a parent uh, obviously i've been through a traditional system of education i was in an icse um, catholic school uh i think one of the things at least most parents know and identify is that so so no before i say that let me say that for most parents what's important is that child success in the world right uh, they i mean just from a from a career and an employment perspective i think uh the school is not an end in itself parents put kids through school because that's the means to an end and the end really is and maybe you you could say gainful employment depending on the strata of society or it could be just a few uh, you know successful career etc so having been through the education i have as a parent like i was saying before i know there are a lot of things about it that i didn't enjoy just like parneet was saying there were so many things that i just like math for example was not my favorite subject and i'd always be looking out of the window right so 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 that's something we've all been through and then when you put that in context and if i was asked by my school what would you want for your child it's success it's not really about whether he or she knows his math and science and english so i think that it's it's a journey it's not something that can happen overnight but i think when you and i have done that for a school that um, i was hoping to set up in the future where i've had groups of parents come and you know we've done uh, uh, you know a uh, group meetings with them and when you take them through two or three hours of of seeing what a future school will look like and how that can mean more success for their child in the future they automatically subscribe to it they want that it's just that they don't know how and it requires some amount of outreach it requires some amount of inputs it requires some amount of and of course there'll always be the 80 20 right there'll be the 20% who will not want to change and who will be traditional and who will be hung up on what they want uh, yeah. but there will be the first 30 40 50% who again like for me said they are early movers early adopters and they will want to subscribe to this so i think it's a process but it can be done uh, because parents want want success for their children right so great i think uh, you know those were great insights and uh, i think there are quite a few other questions which we will probably respond offline and uh, you know make sure they are all addressed uh, uh, you know from our panelists and from ourselves so thank you uh, monica and parmeet once again uh, you know for sharing your insights and uh, thank you audience for joining and you know for your active participation and raising all the questions uh, so i think it was great learning happy weekend everyone see you again thank you thank you so much bye bye thanks a lot then Thanks.